Uh, welcome, welcome to our first presentation. This is uh, this one's titled "Modern Painting Feelings Part One." <laughs> We're going to talk about feelings now. For look, for some of you, I understand this is going to be a review. Some of you have taken some art history in the past, uh, but for many of you. You haven't taken any art history. Um, this, this this class does not have an art history prerequisite, but we do want to get to a point where we're talking about managing the ideas uh, that inform contemporary painting. And in order to understand those ideas, um, I think we have to go back and uh, and uh, look at the beginning of. Uh, of uh, the history of, of modern art and modernism and uh, identify you know, where these ideas come from, okay? Um, so hopefully for those of you uh, for whom this is a review, uh, my perspective will be at least a little different than, uh, than things, you've, things you've covered in the past. Okay, so let's go. Um, start with the definition of modernism and modern art. Now, the birth of modernism and modern art, it can be traced to the Industrial Revolution. Now, this period of rapid changes in manufacturing, transportation, technology, it began around the mid-18th century, so, you know, 1760 or so, and lasted through uh, to the end of the 19th century, profoundly affecting the social, economic, and cultural conditions of life in Western Europe, North America, and eventually the entire world. Now, ding dong. Now, this was a time of unprecedented change. New forms of trans transportation, including the railroad, the subway, eventually the automobile, changed the way people lived, changed the way people worked and traveled, expanding their worldview and their access to new ideas. Now, as urban centers prospered, people moved to the cities for industrial jobs. And I have to understand, up until this point, um, most people uh, in, in the West, in Europe and, and in America, uh, uh, are substance farmers. Uh, their, uh, their, 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 their lives are, they, they live in small villages, people are spread out all across the countryside. But with the, uh, with the advent of, uh, of factory jobs, right, um, there's a massive influx of people moving to the city, okay? Uh, urban centers are prospering, people move to the cities for these industrial jobs, and because of that, the population of the cities boomed. Now, never before in the history of human civilization had so much change happened in such a short period of time. This coincided with, uh, with, uh, with improvement in the quality of education. Uh, statistically, it coincided with a, a giant increase in, in literacy. Um, you just cannot underestimate how much life was changing for most people and how rapidly it was changing. Now, up until this time, um, you know, before the 19th century, artists were most often commissioned to make artwork by wealthy patrons or institutions like the church. Now, much of this art depicted religious or mythological scenes that told stories. The art was narrative, and it was intended to instruct the viewer. This is a, a, an example of a Baroque painting by Nicholas Poussin. It's called Landscape with St. Matthew and the Angel from 1645. And we say landscape, but this is not a real landscape. It's quite a romantic landscape. And in, in fact, it's, I think Poussin composed landscapes entirely or almost entirely, uh, out of his imagination, or, or out of the stories that he was uh, that he was uh, you know, charged with telling. Uh, in this case, we have a romantic valley with a winding river and a tower in the background, and this is Saint Matthew being visited by the angel. The angels bathed in light. They're surrounded by Greco-Roman ruins, signifying the historical weight or the you know the or the narrative weight of the of the situation. Uh, let me show you another Poussin painting. Um, this one's even better. This is uh, this is called A Dance to the Music of Time. Um, this one is 1634 to 1636. The implication there is that he took two years to paint it, 34 to 36. Um, it was a commission for uh, Giulio Raspigliosi, who was later to become Pope Clement IX. And the patron, Giulio, dictated every aspect of 
this painting's detailed iconography. In other words, the artist did not decide what was going to be in the painting. This painting was originally titled The Four Seasons. Uh, it was thought that the figures represented you know, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. Um, but we now understand, or at least the figures are now thought to represent, poverty, work, riches, and pleasure. And these were the central issues of human existence, again, according to the patron who was later to become the Pope. Um, so Poussin was not in charge of what went into the painting. Basically, as an artist, his job was to paint what he was told. Okay. In this painting, we can see, aside from the four figures, you have Father Time playing the lyre, you have the, uh, the, uh, the cherubs, you have Aurora, the goddess of dawn. She's in the sky preceding the chariot of Apollo, the sun god. All of this was dictated by the person who commissioned the painting. And here's another, another example of uh, narrative painting, but also a painting that is, uh, that is uh, uh, done in the service of, in this case, the state, okay? or at least a, a, a powerful nobleman. This is uh, the Emperor Napoleon in his study in 1812. Now, Alexander Hamilton, he was a Scottish nobleman, the 10th Duke of Hamilton, he commissioned David to paint the Emperor Napoleon in his study in the Tuileries in 1811. This painting is full of details that are intended to tell a story, okay, such as a, a clock. Where's the clock? There's a clock here that reads uh, 4.15 a.m. And the burned down candles, they all indicate that Napoleon has been up all night and he's working on the Napoleonic Code, which we can see here. So the painting is full of, uh, of references and clues to the particular narrative that the patron, Alexander Hamilton, is interesting in, interested in having the painting depict, okay, or having the artist uh, illustrate. Uh, Napoleon here is about to pick up his sword and he's going to go and review his troops, suggesting an impressive degree of endurance. He's up all night. He's working hard, but he's still going. He's not planning to sleep today. Now, David's painting, this is one of the last formal portraits of the great French ruler. Uh, it's a great example of, uh, of uh, a narrative painting painted, you know, in the service of the state or according to um, the directives of the patron. Now let's talk about photography. This is what happens next, okay? Um, before there's any serious changes in the art of the time, there's changes in technology. Now, the rise of Impressionism, which is largely considered to be uh, the, the first important modern art movement, okay? Now, it can be seen in part as a response by artists to the newly established medium of photography. The taking of fixed or still images provided a new medium with which to capture reality, and it changed the way that people in general and artists in particular saw the world. Photography influenced painting in many ways. It challenged the idea that painting's purpose was to accurately represent reality. And it inspired a new kind of cropping in pictures. It, it allowed people uh, to be able to see things from a new perspective. Looking at pictures is very different than looking at the world, right? With the Impressionists, we now see artists selecting only a part of a subject to be included in the picture plane, cropping, right? Allowing for the possibility of a more intimate connection with the viewer. Photography also influenced the Impressionist's interest in capturing a snapshot of ordinary people doing ordinary, everyday things. Now, this is considered to be the first Impressionist painting. It's by Claude Monet. It's called Impression Sunrise from 1872. Now, rather than compete with the ability of the photograph to record reality directly, okay? Recording reality, that's what painting had always done. But now photography is doing it. And so the Impressionists, they feel free to represent what they see in an entirely new way, focusing more on light, color, atmosphere, and movement in a way that was not possible with photography. Remember, when we talk about photography in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, we're talking about black and white photography. So one thing the painting had that photography didn't have was color and all the expressive possibilities that color 
could, uh, could uh, make use of, right? Now, over time, this new approach to painting became more widely accepted, okay? But initially, these first Impressionist paintings were thought to be very sketchy, very unfinished, and they were not popular. This is Claude Monet. Um, he painted this series of haystacks. There, there's a lot of them we're going to talk about. Okay, So it's a, a series of haystacks that he painted between 1890 and 1891. So an intensive period of work. Okay, You can think of these paintings as being made in response to photography. Photography could now do what was previously only possible in painting. It could capture images of reality and accurately represent the visual world. The Impressionists responded to this challenge presented by photography by experimenting with their techniques, with their styles, and with their subjects, and to question painting's role in modern life. Now that, that is probably the most important point I'm going to make in this presentation. They were using painting to ask what is the role of painting, okay? It becomes a little bit meta, right from the beginning of modernism. Now, the subject of the painting, again, because, because photography can represent the world, photography can show you a picture of, of, of what the world looks like. So the subject of the painting now becomes perception. Okay, human perception. Monet was one of the first artists to use repetition to show differences in perception, such as the time of day, the seasons, changes in the weather. Now, the consistency of the subject matter, it was always haystacks, okay, he was just moving around these haystacks in the field, provided the opportunity to compare changes of light and mood and atmosphere across a series of paintings. This has never been done before. Now, the first paintings in the series were started in late September, early October, 1890. He continued producing these paintings, all based on observations of the same subject in the same location for about seven months. Remember, we talked about the landscape uh, in the Poussin painting, how it was largely imaginary. It was representative of a, an ideal or a romantic landscape. Well, this is not. This is actually a depiction of what Monet is experiencing with his senses. Now, there were two innovations that made it easier than ever for artists to paint outdoors directly from nature. Okay? Technological advances in transportation, for instance, both by railroad and by automobile, automobile it allowed people to travel farther and faster to get to where they were going so that they could be there when they wanted to be there. And with the introduction of paint in tubes, okay, we have factories producing paint now. Artists don't have to make it themselves. And this paint stayed wet in the tubes and it was easily transportable. So artists were freed from having to mix and store their own paint and they could work anywhere that they wanted. Well, these paintings made Monet the first painter to paint such a large quantity of pictures of the same subject matter, depicting shifts in light, shifts in weather, shifts in atmosphere, and shifts in perspective, meaning he's moving around the field. And you're seeing the haystacks not only in different lighting conditions, but from different angles, different heights, different perspectives. Now, artists like Henry Matisse and Paul Cezanne continued to paint traditional subject matter, like landscapes, portraits, still lifes. These, are, these have been the subject of art for hundreds of years. Okay? And they explored these subjects, however, in surprising and innovative new ways. Here we have uh, Paul Cezanne's basket of apples and Henry Matisse. Oh, I'm not sure uh, the title of that painting is coming up, I think. Um, now, Henry Matisse, let's focus on him for a minute. Was The question here is, is, the, is he the inventor of abstraction? Okay. Now, in 1896, after working for a time in the style of the Impressionists, Matisse announced that he just couldn't stand it anymore, and he abandoned his earth-colored palette for bright post-Impressionist colors. This is called Woman with a Hat, 1905. Now, if we go back and we look at Monet's haystacks, while they are... Uh, there's a, there's a, there, you, you could think of them as being abstracted, but they're abstracted, again, based on his actual perception, on what he was actually seeing with the changes in the light and the atmosphere of the scene. Okay? Um, he's not inventing 
He's recording what he sees. The difference between that and what Matisse is doing is Matisse is inventing. He is incorporating things in his painting that are not there in his model or in his subject or in what he's looking at. Okay, he's thinking of uh, of uh, uh, the the painting as a as a composition, and allowing himself to use color, shape, line, form, uh, in any way he sees fit. And as time goes on, his work becomes increasingly more abstract. This is uh, the dance from 1909. The woman with the hat was from 1905. Now, the dance is considered a very important painting, both in Matisse's career and in the development of modern painting. It reflects Matisse's fascination with primitive art, and it marks a key moment in his move towards abstraction. Okay, The intense warm colors against the cool blue-green background, the rhythmical grouping of dancing nudes conveys feelings of emotional liberation and hedonism. Okay, so much like this painting is uh, often often compared to uh, Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. Okay, so for the first time we have painting beginning to do something that it was already accepted that music could do. It was accepted that music could be abstract, that music could generate an emotional response just based on sounds, based on abstractions, right? Uh, and we now have painting being thought of in the same way. And this is an early Picasso. It's from Picasso's blue period. It's called Acrobat on a Ball. It's from 1905. Now, in 1906, the year after this painting was made, Matisse met Pablo Picasso. Now, they, although they, uh, they did, they became lifelong friends. They were also rivals. Uh, they were very competitive, and their works were often compared to one another uh, in, in the press by art critics. Okay? They, they both often painted the female figure. They both often painted still lifes. Uh, but while Picasso painted largely from his imagination, uh, Matisse drew inspiration from nature. Now, one thing that does characterize these the rapid changes in painting in the early part of the 20th century, again, we've gone from the late 1800s. This painting is made in 1929. It's a Picasso painting uh, called Blue Acrobat. I, I love this painting. I just think it's crazy. Compare this acrobat from 1929 and the degree of abstraction represented in the painting to this acrobat from uh, 1905. You see that Picasso is experimenting with... Uh, I don't want to just use the, the phrase abstraction. What he's experimenting with is the possibility of painting to uh, function not as a record of reality, but as a record of the artist's thought processes, let's say. Um, you can see the acrobat here. You can see that it's an acrobat, a contortionist. It's someone, uh, someone uh, you know, moving in, uh, in, a, in an extreme way, certainly. I think this painting's just hilarious. Um, so like Matisse, what we see here, like Matisse and what we saw in the dance, uh, with the passage of time, as his style developed, Picasso's depictions became more abstracted and more fragmented. And then there's this. You... Uh, you, know, you don't have to go all the way to 1929 to find artists painting mm, pictures that are uh, say representative of feelings. Um, this is uh, Edvard Munch. This is a scream from 1893. Uh, he's a Norwegian artist. His work is aligned with, uh, with a movement in art that we refer to as German Expressionism. Um, but he's Norwegian. Now, the figure in this painting is uh, is one of the most iconic images in modern art. Okay, this is again way back in 1893. Um, it's now considered the prototypical example of an artist's representation of the anxiety of the human condition. Okay, um, the, you can see the the figure's face here is very it's strangely. Uh, strangely androgynous. We don't know if it's a man or a woman. We just know that it, 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 it's feeling 
troubled, <laughs> quite troubled. Uh, now, Munch said uh, about this painting that uh, he'd been out for a walk, that the setting sun had turned the clouds a blood red color, and that what he sensed was an infinite scream passing through nature. So, again, this painting is uh, is not intended to represent the the physical world. It's uh, it's uh, absolutely a, uh, a a representation of uh, of, of a person's inner life or, or or a person's state of mind. Now let's step back a little bit again. Um, now Paul Cezanne, he once claimed that art is a harmony running parallel to nature, not an imitation of nature. Again, he's living in a time when photography exists and he fully understands that photography can do that for us now. Photography can, can imitate nature, represent nature. Painting must be useful in a new way, he thought. He became interested in exploring the underlying structure and composition of painting, and he, he came to believe that as an artist, he did not have to be restricted to representing real objects in real space. This is a detail of, uh, of a basket of apples. What I love about these apples and what, uh, the way, the way this, this painting and other paintings by, uh, by Cezanne are, are often talked about is, uh, is the way the paintings address the mass, the weight, the volume of the apples. These apples, I mean, my goodness, they're like, uh, they're like cannonballs. I mean, you can imagine picking one up in your hand and feeling the weight of it, right? He's painting, he's painting the mass of the object. And the painting contains what I want to call purposeful errors, okay? So he's using abstraction long before Matisse and, uh, and Picasso are embracing abstraction gradually in their work, moving towards the 1920s. This is still back in 1893. Cezanne is embracing abstraction, but in a way that uh, in, in a way that suggests he sees abstraction as a useful tool in describing reality. Okay, now Basket of Apples contains one of his signature tilted tables. Okay, there's an impossible rectangle here, this table with no real right angles. You can see the line of it in the back goes across, but it continues somehow right here. Um, the basket of apples is pitched forward against a, a slab of some kind, this box or this stone slab, uh, seemingly balanced by, by this bottle and by the tablecloth's thick sculptural folds. The exaggerated mass I referred to of the apples, the aggressive brushwork and the use of the, the glowing colors that he chose all give the composition a density and a dynamic quality that a more realistic still life just couldn't convey. But the craziest thing about this painting is right here, the stack of biscuits or cookies. Let's zoom in on the cookies. Now the cookies stacked below the top layer. They seem as if they're viewed from the side. Let me show you again where these are in the painting. They're sitting right there. They're all stacked up except for these two that seem to be floating forward in space. Now the two on top seem to pop upward as if we're looking down at them. Okay, the rest of them all seem as though we're viewing them from the side. Now, at first, it might appear as if he was simply unable to draw. You know, it would be a fair assumption. But if you spend more time and you look more closely, it might occur to you that Cezanne is, in fact, drawing carefully, but according to a new set of rules. Instead of painting what we see from a single vantage point, perhaps he's painting how we see. In other words, we move as we see. Right? If, if we were in the space with the basket of apples and the plate of cookies, we'd be, we wouldn't be stationary like a camera. We'd be moving around it and looking at it from, from different perspectives, right? from one side and then the other. Um, so instead of painting what we see from a single vantage point, perhaps he's painting how we see. In other words, we move as we see. In contemporary terms, one might say that human vision is less like the frozen vision of a still camera and more like the continuous vision of a video camera, allowing for the perception of a scene or an object across time and from differing vantage points. Maybe that's what's happening here with these cookies. He's allowing us to see what they look like from the top 
to avoid the confusion that might happen if we only saw them stacked up from the side. We wouldn't know what they were. And the next thing that happens in modern art is so closely, re so closely related to what I'm suggesting is going on in this Cezanne painting that, uh, that it, it, it pretty much removes the, uh, the, the possibility that we're wrong about the Cezanne painting. Picasso saw the Cezanne, okay? And the concern seems simple in Cezanne's painting. His concern was representing the true experience of sight but it had enormous implications for 20th century visual culture. Now, cubism developed as a direct response to Cezanne's abstraction innovation. Okay, Cubism was a, a revolutionary new approach to representing reality. It was invented around 1907 by artists Pablo Picasso and George Brock. They were working together. They aimed to bring different views of subjects together in the same picture, resulting in paintings that are fragmented and abstracted. So here we have... Girl with Mandolin from 1910. And uh, the idea of this painting is that, uh, again, as people in space, confronted with objects in space, we are objects, you know, um, among objects, uh, we're moving. And we're, and we're able to, to view things uh, from a, a continuously shifting perspective. And that's what these cubist paintings represent. They represent the possibility of depicting um, in a fragmented way, a subject from many angles all at the same time. Here's a George Brock painting. It's called Bottle and Fishes, 1910-1912. It's doing pretty much the same thing. Now, Cubism was a, a hugely innovative movement in painting. It suggested a new way of depicting visual reality. It had a tremendous influence on how a whole generation of artists thought about the possibilities available to them in painting. Now, it's considered a starting point for many later abstract styles. Now, let me show you a few of these abstract styles. This is Umberto Boccioni. Um, this is called Dynamism of a Cyclist from 1913. Now, the Futurists, they declared in their manifesto their intention to find a new way of representing our whirling life of steel, of pride, of fever, and of speed. They loved modernity and machinery, and their paintings revealed their preoccupation with speed, with modern methods of transport, and the depiction of the dynamic sensation of movement. So, while the Cubist paintings were interested in depicting a somewhat static reality from multiple perspectives or multiple points of view, the Futurists took uh, the, the, this strategy, but they they adapted it. Uh, uh, if you're if you're depicting a world in which everything is moving fast, um, we become somewhat stationary in relation to that world. Uh, and, and so in, instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, depicting with their with their fragmented compositions, instead of depicting a stationary subject from multiple perspectives, they're depicting a moving subject from a stationary perspective. This is a tough one. This is, uh, well, I say that maybe, maybe for you it's not. Um, this is called Black Square, 1915, Kazimir Malevich. Uh, it's a hugely important um, early, early minimalist modern painting. He painted his first Black Square in 1915. It's one of the seminal works of modern art and of Western art generally. Now, it is significant. Its significance lies in how it marks a break between representational, pa representational painting and abstract painting. Okay, it's 1915. Most painting is representational, including the Cubist and Futurist work that we just looked at. It's about, uh, if not representing how things look, it's certainly about representing how we see things, okay? But Malevich, he's doing something else. He declared this square, this black square, as a work of suprematism. It's a movement which he, he popularized, but which is associated almost exclusively with his own work. I don't know of any other uh, suprematists, just Malevich. He was, he was uh, a bit of a lone wolf. Now, the detail that you're seeing in this, the, uh, the white line work that's in the square, that wouldn't have been there in the... In, in the uh, 
at the time when the painting was made. That's, uh, the painting is cracked and deteriorated a little bit. It would have simply been a very reductivist black square floating on a white background, nothing more. Here we have, um, this is a painting by Bert van der Leck. It's called Composition from 1918. Okay, now this is a de Stil painting, meaning style in Dutch. Now, de Stil was, it was a circle, a small group of Dutch abstract artists who promoted a style of art based on a strict geometry of only horizontal and vertical lines and shapes. Okay, it was founded in 1917 by Piet Mondrian and Theo van Doesburg. It had a profound influence on the develop of both abstract art, if you're familiar with uh, 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 the Bauhaus school, it also had a tremendous uh, influence on the development of modern architecture and modern design. Now the point of this work is that it's reductive. Along with Malevich we have these Dutch paintings thinking um, uh, what makes a painting a painting. Right? What are the bare minimum uh, uh, components necessary to uh, call something art, right? It's reductivist. It's about uh, it's about uh, uh, kind of a search for for another purpose for art beyond representing reality, beyond representing the natural world. It had to do with spirituality and uh, and representing uh, psychological states as opposed to representing reality. This is called The Art Critic. Uh, this is a, a piece by Raoul Hausman. This is an example of uh, early data work. And we're going to talk about data a bit more, uh, well, <laughs> quite a bit more, in, uh, in uh, subsequent uh, presentations. Uh, but this, again, it, I just wanted to, to, to place it historically here. This is made in 1919. It's a collage. Uh, now, data was formed in Zurich as a response to the horrors of the First World War, which is coming to a close at this point. The aim of data artists was to destroy traditional values in art, to create a new art that could reflect the modern world. Now, the art and the poetry and the performance produced by data artists is often satirical and nonsensical in nature. Now, in addition to being anti-war, Data was also anti-bourgeois and, in fact, anti-art. It was very much an anarchist uh, art movement. And it had political affinities with the radical left. Now we have surrealism. Here's, uh, here's a, a Salvador Dali painting. This one is called The Persistence of Memory. This is from 1931. Now, surrealism, again, a hugely important and influential art movement. Now, the goal of surrealism was to explore the unconscious. Again, photography can uh, you know, describe the world for us. It can represent real objects in real space. So artists are searching for, for other ways for painting to be useful. And with the publication of psychologist Sigmund Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, uh, which was published in 1899, and Carl Jung's The Psychology of the Unconscious, published in 1912, and with the popularization of the idea of a subconscious mind. This is a new idea that there's that there's we have motivating factors within us that are that are not conscious or are subconscious uh, that we're driven by by things we can't control. Many artists began exploring dreams symbolism and personal iconography as avenues for the depiction of their subjective experiences. So again, whereas at one time artists were charged with simply uh, uh, painting what they were told, artists are now at the beginning of a, you know, about a 30-year period that we've just looked at, where they're starting to think about how, uh, what the use of the art can be uh, what the function of painting is, and uh, and instead of representing the outer world or stories that uh, are are important to the society, uh, artists are now becoming interested in depicting their own subjective inner experiences. Okay, so uh, so I think that's enough for. Uh, for today, um, I'll leave it at that, um, and uh, and I guess I'll see you next time with uh, with uh, modern art feelings, <laughs> part two. 
Okay, take care, everybody.